think um, we've hit 50 and rising. I think we will get started. It's just after nine o'clock. So good morning, everybody. I'm Tim Lawton, chair of the uh, All Party Parliamentary Group for 1001 Days. And you are all very welcome to our first um, meeting of 2022. And we have got a stellar panel of half a dozen uh, speakers the, uh, uh, this morning. Th this is the first of a series of uh, meetings that the APPG is doing on family hubs in the first 1001 uh, days. And you will all recall that the Best Start for Life uh, vision set out an ambition for all families to be able to access midwifery, health visiting, infant feeding, and mental health support within family hubs. We had the announcement last year in the spending review of 300 million to start with for the Start for Life uh, packages, and that there are gonna be some 75 local authority areas, roughly half, uh, local authorities to start with uh, who will benefit uh, from that uh, and various workforce pilots uh, as uh, as well. In December the government's draft framework for family hubs also referred to the need for them to provide a best start for life uh, offer so this is very much part of the uh, of the government language um, now and uh, with Andrew Ledson uh, still heading up that task force it's uh, really important that we push ahead with, uh, with that. So this um, first meeting, a virtual meeting, alas, we still can't um, meet in the House of uh, Commons. Apparently visitors to all party groups are singularly risky for some reason, goodness knows why. We're only allowed one outsider per APPG for physically to come in. Hopefully that's gonna change soon, but it does mean I think we um, can access rather more people um, virtually. So this meeting is about how midwives and health visiting services can work with family hubs. And we're going to discuss the various opportunities provided by those recent policy developments I've mentioned, as well as the, the challenges um, and not least the current shortfalls that we all know about in midwifery and health visiting uh, workforce um, uh, numbers. Just a few housekeeping rules. This is a, a Zoom um, webinar. We've got um, people from all around the, the, the country who are signed up to the APPG. We've got parliamentarians uh, here. Um, so people can't be seen or heard unless you're one of the um, panelists. We'll use the Q&A function to, uh, if you want to table a, uh, a question, and then I will do my best to pick out as many questions as possible when we have a, Q, uh, a discussion at the, uh, at the end of it. If there are any comments you want to put in uh, as well, then please uh, do, and then everybody can see those uh, in the chat uh, function um, there. Um, and the meeting, just a warning, is going to be recorded, and then it's available to share on our website and um, the Parent Infant Foundation uh, and YouTube um, afterwards. So without further ado, is everyone in the right meeting? Um, if not, then log out now. Otherwise, I'm going to call on our first um, speaker, and I'm really pleased we have Jess, uh, um, uh, Reed, who's the Deputy Chief Midwifery Officer for uh, England, uh, responsible for leadership and the profession NHS England and NHS Improvement. Um, Jess, you're very um, welcome. You're going to uh, talk for uh, a short while uh, about the uh, whole role of midwifery in the best start in, uh, in life. Uh, and then we'll come back to everybody for questions and, uh, and, and comment at the, at the end. Unless, let me just check with Sally, are we anticipating taking questions after each speaker, if they're specific to those, and then there'll be more discussion at the, uh, at, at the end. So if we have time, and I'm gonna try and keep to time because we have a, a strict cutoff of 11 o'clock uh, this morning, we'll take questions after Jess. Uh, if not, there'll be a second opportunity at the, uh, at the end. Yes. Okay, Jess, over to you in that case. Thank you so much, Tim and colleagues, and thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you this morning about uh, midwifery impact with maternity hubs. Um, so as Tim has said, um, I'm Jess and I work with the Chief Midwifery Officer's Office in NHS England and Improvement and uh, have been working closely with our maternity transformation programme to um, deliver on this work around maternity hubs. Next slide, please. That familiar phrase. Next slide, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so we are all aware that Better Births, the most recent maternity mandate, was published in 2016 to 17, chaired by um, the Baroness Julia Cumberledge, 
who has done a huge amount of work in this area and we're very, very grateful for that. Um, and we're aware that this is where maternity hubs were first really introduced for us in, in, in our field. Um, and, and it became very apparent that it was important that services, our maternity services should be organised around the woman and her family. Um, and that it was seen that community hubs could help to access services that, that help to um, make sure that women could access services that were needed um, to provide family orientated health, social services, etc. Um, by, by our statutory and voluntary agencies. And it would all be in one, one place, one convenient place, one hub. Um, so local maternity systems, we call them LMSs um, for short, were asked to identify what range in their own locality, so it should be locally based, uh, responding to the local needs of the population, um, to identify the range of services that could be brought together through a community hub, which would be based, as I said, on the needs of the community. Um, and uh, NHS England and Improvement provided infrastructure to, to work towards and pathways were also commissioned. So as I've mentioned, the community hubs were, are there to serve two key purposes. One is to be a one-stop shop, um, to be able to provide many services, uh, and this would mean uh, different teams operating out of the same, the same one area, one hub, one facility. It was also to provide a fast and effective referral service to the right expert if a woman and her baby needed more specialised services. And what was stated was that services could be co-located within midwifery units, uh, services that we already have in place, community hospitals, children's centres, primary care centres or community centres. We have seen some other very innovative uh, ideas around where to base community hubs, I must say, since they've started to be established. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we are aware since their inception that, that community hubs are really beneficial, really work well in, for rural populations, deprived communities, and for women with very complex social factors. They provide services that are easily accessible and relatable. So women are able to, communities are able to build relationships with uh, the, the staff that they see on a regular basis, they may see on a regular basis within the hubs. And midwives that are embedded in their communities um, find, find it a much, much better way to work and operate because it reduces their travel time um, and it means that they are much more embedded within, within their community with, with the local women and their families. And there's real, we, we have seen real potential in being able to co-locate new maternal mental health services and perinatal uh, health services within community hubs, and some are indeed, indeed doing that. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just an example of um, some of the things that are happening within our maternity hubs across England. So uh, there's over 100 maternity hubs established at the moment. We want to see more. In fact, I was just visiting um, the Royal Surrey uh, in, in uh, County Hospital in, in, in Guildford yesterday and they are just about to launch two more um, community hubs, one of which is in, although of course being Surrey, they don't have that much deprivation, but uh, one of those hubs is, is deliberately being um, placed in, in one of their more deprived areas, which is encouraging to hear. Um, and they were also uh, explaining how, how, very, how very well utilized the other, they've currently got five in there um, that they work with, five community hubs, and, um, and how, how effective they have been. Thank you. Next slide, please. So you may be aware that continuity of care, provision of, um, of a known <coughs> midwife to women throughout their pregnancy and, and, and women and their families throughout their pregnancies is one of our key mandates for maternity services. 
And we found that community hubs really do support effective continuity of care teams by uh, basing those teams within the community hub, giving the teams uh, easy access to other professionals, to our health visiting colleagues, to our medical colleagues, to um, social services colleagues, should that be necessary. So um, they are really, really effective in helping us to deliver on this particular um, uh, aim. And what we do know is that place-based continuity of care creates those safe spaces for women and their families. It's much more likely, I mean, we, you, you will all be aware of this, that it's, it's much more effective when we take care out into the community, um, especially in our rural populations, in our deprived populations, rather than expecting those women to come to us. Um, a lot of women experience fear and, and anxiety about approaching health services and, and don't actually know how to approach health services. So I think in terms of meeting the needs of the most vulnerable in our populations, um, the community hubs have a huge, huge role in this. Uh, women feel more able to disclose difficult circumstances. They are they build relationships. That is key to um, to being able to deliver safe care. That that relationship is at the centre of that trust, trusted uh, tr trust that's needed for for families to be able to be open and real about what their needs are. Um, and also we know that uh, women who receive hospital-based continuity of carer do describe a sort of lack of, of community linkage and, and community input. Um, and and that, that, that means that they end up feeling unfamiliar when they go into um, the, the hospital, hospital um, settings. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is just to, to show you, I'm sure many of you will have seen this, um, this slide before, um, the model of what maternity, maternity care could look like for women who are living in areas of uh, ethnic diversity and, and, and social disadvantage. So it, it's just a really lovely um, slide to be able to explain that and show this. And you can see um, the list at the side where, of the benefits that this brings. To, um, to our communities. Um, and I'm sure I'm very happy for these slides to be shared. So you'll be able to um, see that in, in greater detail um, once you've had them sent out to you. Thank you, next slide, please. So we've got a case study here. It's always nice, isn't it, to hear what, what does this mean? What does this mean in, in, in action? So we know that the, um, in Lincolnshire, uh, the coast of Lincolnshire, experiences one of the highest levels of, of, of social deprivation and, um, and also an undeveloped transport infrastructure, which makes access to services for families really much more difficult. So two of their eight community hubs are in isolated coastal towns, um, both Skegness and Maplethorpe. And these two towns previously have been underserved by NHS maternity services. So these two hubs have been key, have been vital in providing that, that care out into these deprived communities. And how did they do it? Well, they set up working parties to develop the site and to ensure that the community hubs reflected what the local communities wanted. And as well as providing maternal and health, maternity and health service services, the hubs also in this locality have provided smoking cessation and breastfeeding support, training and employment advice, and childcare and early education support. This is what was needed in this, in this particular area. To achieve this, they absolutely, it was so important that they had political support, that they had collective buy-in across agencies, that they had professionals internally and externally and a willingness to share resources and contribute, putting the needs of the project over the needs of the individual organisation. And I should say here, probably putting the needs of the population over the needs of the individual organisations. Next slide, please. So the outcomes, this is really important to note. And it's lovely to see those pictures. <laughs> um, there has been a 10% increase in the engagement of universal families across the area. The engagement of vulnerable families has risen 59% to 91%. That's just incredible. Um, 
Breastfeeding rates have increased by approximately 10%, which is equally really, really um, important to see. And 67% of the families that have attended antenatal top tips have continued to engage in the children's centre. I think that's also really important, isn't it? That, you know, you hook the families in, they know where they can go and receive support. Uh, I know of, of hubs in the London area where they have a particular outreach to women who have mental health concerns and issues and they have safe spaces and they continue with those safe spaces for women to attend and join and talk to other women and to professionals about those mental health challenges way beyond um, the initial 28 days that midwives generally care for, for women at post birth, which is really important. Next slide, please. So this is the final slide and then I'll stop. Um, it's important that we acknowledge the challenges in, um, in being able to deliver maternity hubs um, in the community, identifying appropriate buildings and of course the cost of the rent. Um, so you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with the um, many closures up and down the country of ch children's centres, um, rent going up, which means that services can't afford to, to, to use those, those premises, capital costs of refurbishment to make which to, in order to make those premises suitable for healthcare, Wi-Fi access, access to IT, particularly in rural locations, um, that's a challenge for a general, the general population, but even more so, I think, for uh, health services in these areas. And engagement across the whole sector, um, health, local authority and the voluntary sector has also in some areas been a challenge. And of course, um, it goes without saying, I think uh, the pandemic has had a massive impact on staff. Um, uh, staffing numbers have been challenged hugely. So, um, and inevitably that has caused a pause in some of the plans to roll out. But as I mentioned earlier, I was really pleased to hear yesterday that there were two more going to be opened um, before the summer um, in Surrey. So I think these, where, where these, um, where these hubs are working well and where the plans are robust and where there has been the proper engagement and the proper funding, um, they are going ahead, um, which is good to hear. Okay, I'll stop there and I'm very happy to take questions now if there's time, Tim, because I will actually have to have to leave, I'm afraid. Yes, thank you very much for that. C can I just kick off because I have, uh, please anybody put um, comments in the in the Q&A if you want to ask specifically a question to Jess now. Um, has there been any sort of, sort of cost benefit analysis of the the hubs in terms of you've got some very impressive figures there from the case study in, uh, in, in Lincolnshire for how it's better engagement increase in, uh, in breastfeeding and then no doubt has prevented um, mums then developing mental illnesses or, or other uh, uh, problems that obviously is a great uh, 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 cost uh, to various parts of the NHS afterwards. And of course, this is always looked at by the NHS and by the Treasury in terms of cost benefit analysis. So has there been any, uh, any study done so far that can show that, that not only is this great um, for, 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 for mums and families, but actually it's, it's cost effective to do it this way as well, as I'm sure we would all urge. And secondly, at some of the examples you've seen across those now over 100 hubs, which is, which is encouraging, are there any particularly innovative um, centres that you've seen in terms of co-location with other, other services rather than just setting up a service on its, on its own? Are we putting them in, uh, in libraries or in um, other community centres or even in pubs I've seen certain um, yeah. NH services and others uh, offered so that you've got those shared facilities yeah. and an even busier hub of various other services that somebody may come in because they want breastfeeding advice and lo and behold they're getting some advice on housing and whatever issues as, as well. Yes. Um, well, just respond to the second one first. There are, we've got lots of examples of where there's uh, been innovations, different innovations used, Tim, to get these hubs up and running. Churches is another community, yep. was another community place that has, or old churches that aren't used any longer, etc. Um, so yeah, where there's a will, there's a way is what I would say. And I think where it works best is where there has been that real engagement across the local population, understanding the needs of that local population 
to and and making sure that those services are accessible that are needed the most um, depending on the needs of the so it will differ up and down the country but yes we have got lots of other examples and very happy to bring other examples along if that would be helpful at some other time um, in terms of the cost benefit analysis i'm sure that has been done um, Tim, I don't because as you quite rightly say, we have to do that in order to get get recurrent funding to be able to um, yeah. continue with this work. So, um, but I don't have that information with me um, at the moment. I've written it down in my notebook, and I'll bring it back to you if I may. I'll email Sally and and send her that uh, an answer to that question. Great, Jess. Thank you very much. And I think, as you said, we'll make sure these slides and all the other presentations this morning are available on the the Parenting Information Foundation uh, website, so uh, anybody can get access to them then. Um, right. I've got a question from Celia in the Q and A, um, thanking you for your very exciting presentation. Have there been any volunteering or peer support programs set up with the hubs? Yeah. So there have been, Celia. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Very good. Um, very good point. So um, I don't know if you're aware of Maternity Mates is one um, particular peer support set up that operates um, through is one of the charities that, that operates doula support and support for women from particular <coughs> diverse minority backgrounds. Um, that's one that, that we work very closely with in East London. Um, and there's one that's established up in the northeast, I believe, which is which is doula support, just the doula support. And that is, again, lining up local community women with um, uh, with women from this from a similar background to be able to provide that support. That's that's voluntary and they do a phenomenal piece of work. And I believe that that also operates from a maternity hub. So there are, a lot, are quite a lot of examples of that. It's, it's quite patchy. It depends on what region you're in as to what's available, but um, there is linkage. And that's why it's good that the, you know, the LMS is the local maternity services and what will be the integrated care services are very involved, are very fully involved in the development of these hubs to make sure that access to all the local voluntary um, uh, services and charities are, are, are linked up. Thanks, Jess. Um, Sally Ann Hart, the MP for uh, Hastings and Rye. Sally, over to you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Jessica. That was really um, interesting. I wondered, and Tim has raised it, I wondered um, by looking at other community groups, but have you got, have you actually done any partnership working with a family hub so far? Because when you're looking at family hubs, they're obviously going to be doing very similar things, apart from the maternity aspect. And um, so it's the, it's the sort of partnership funding of family hubs. So it might, I don't know if you've done any, um, if you have any uh, partnership with a family hub anywhere, I'd be really interested in that. because I think it's probably something that could be done. Yes, absolutely, Sally. Um, I would be too. I'll, I'll need to go back and find out exactly what, uh, whether that has been, um, been undertaken in some areas. I'll, I'll find out for you, Sally, and I'll get back to you. I think it's a good point, uh, Jess. I mean, the, the yeah. interaction between maternity hubs and family hubs is going to be key because otherwise we're going to have, have hubs all over the place. And how do the hubs talk to each other, work with each other, where clearly there's overlapping, uh, overlapping stuff there? It could save costs by being in the same building, the well, same I'm hub, yeah. I'm tempted to say, Sally, to be honest, I think it's the same thing. I think the maternity hubs are in the family hubs, but I don't want to say that without just checking it. So okay. let me if that is the case. Okay, um, now we've got a bit of a long and technical question from Lydia. I'll read it out. Uh, the needs of babies and their families are impacted by economic disadvantage, but about with all we know about development from conception to three, the impact of maternal stress on the fetus, infant parent attachment, etc. should economic advantage be primary, the driver for establishing community hubs, or should they be universal available to all? And she mentions that Surrey and other apparently um, advantaged areas, her family's living in poverty, public transport is very limited. And that last point is a very good point. And my constituency is in, in Sussex, where again, we're perhaps grouped together with the affluent Southeast, but there are some real pockets of deprivation. I don't have an affluent constituency at all. Um, uh, Sally Ann in Hastings, very similar coastal uh, community where we have some wards in the top 20% deprived wards in the 
uh, in the country. So there's always the risk that you look at the bigger picture, oh, that's an affluent part of the country, but you miss some real pockets of deprivation who absolutely will benefit from some of these services. So how, how should it be rolled out? So, well, that's again, that goes back to the point I made, um, Tim and colleagues, about um, they, the, this is down to the local maternity system and the ICS who will know uh, where their populations of most uh, that have the most need within their local areas. So, and, and as I mentioned, um, the, the, two, the new, two new ones going out in Surrey, one of them is going into their, uh, their, their most deprived area. So, yes, you're right. There are uh, of course, there are areas of pop of deprivation across. I mean, in in you know big cities, you have you know millionaire roads next to social housing. So there, th you're absolutely right. Um, we do follow the um, principles of universal proportionalism. Pr 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 I can't even say it. Sorry, Propor proportionalism that Michael Marmont has written so well about. And so we we absolutely do. Um, want to make sure that we are providing services to those most at need first um, to make sure that we um, we are meeting those need that those those highest needs um, and then of course we will be rolling out more more generally across the country but we we tend to follow that principle in all that we're doing in maternity Right. Those are all the questions I've had and we've, we've we're just ahead of time slightly so thank you very much Jess for that sure. presentation. Um, there's, I've just seen somebody's put a comment in the, the chat. In Reading in Berkshire, we're trying to work with our maternity and health visitors, and they're delivering more and more from our children's uh, centres. Uh, and oh, no, somebody's just come in with a, uh, with a question. Essay, who is that? Can we go live, Sally, can we go live to um, the essay in the chat there or not? This is getting far too technical from uh, uh, from me. Oh no, it was Sally. I'm sorry. It was um, it was Sally Ann's question. That's why she, Sally Ann both put up a yellow hand and put a question in the Q and A, which completely flummoxed me. Right, Jess, thank you very much. In uh, in okay. indeed, that's really helpful for kicking off our uh, our program uh, this morning. And if you can any further information, if you can pass it on to Piff, and we'll put it um, uh, put it on the website so everybody can uh, can see and report back at our next meeting. Thank be. you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye bye. Um. Right, now our second presentation, it, we're very keen to drill down into how things are happening on the, uh, on the ground. Uh, and so we've got some representatives from uh, some of the local uh, uh, authorities. First of all, we've got Sarah Newman from uh, Westminster, uh, part of the By Borough um, Children's Services from Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea and, uh, and the City of Westminster. And then secondly, from Wirral, we've got Joe Simpson, who's the early childhood locality manager, and Lindsay Costello, who's the health visiting uh, lead in the, uh, in the Wirral. So, uh, Sarah, can I start with you, please? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Tim, and good morning, everyone. Um, so, I'm Sarah Newman. I'm the uh, Exec Director for Children's Services across the By Borough, which is Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea. Um, and I've been asked to come along and talk about the way that we've joined up our maternity and health visiting services through our family hubs. Now, um, we first started talking about family hubs <clears throat> back in 2016, um, really having a vision of a joined up early help offer. And <clears throat> quite interesting, I think, is right from the start, we were really clear that family hubs had to be more than just the building, really about a way of working um, to provide a fully integrated model of uh, family support. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So um, in order to achieve it, we created a multi-agency steering group to really drive a vision and develop a roadmap so that we could start to remove barriers, because we all know that different uh, policy drivers and different uh, professional groups all have a tendency to see things through their own lens um, and prioritise what's important to them. And what we wanted to do was really create that sense of this is what we want to do for our local area and this is how we're going to achieve it. In uh, Westminster, we now have three family hubs. In Kensington and Chelsea, we have two. And each of them have their own integrated leadership team. 
um, consisting of managers from different organisations um, really sharing ac that accountability for the local offer. Um, our community health providers have been an important partner right from the start and really being key to the family hub offer, um, linking up other health services and thinking particularly about GPs and uh, midwifery. We've also uh, had to develop comprehensive data sharing agreements um, that allows us to share new birth records and really allows our staff to get to understand the local families that they're supporting. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, and, and, and I guess uh, really importantly, uh, uh, builds on a point I think you were making, Tim, that in Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea, they are wealthy boroughs. Um, and, 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 you know, often thought of as wealthy boroughs. But there are significant areas of deprivation in both of them. And actually, the wealth gap is considerable. I think in Kensington and Chelsea, the wealth gap is probably the highest in the country. So we know we achieve some really great outcomes for children um, in comparison with other areas. But interestingly, we consistently perform poorly for children in their early years. And I'm thinking in terms of the uh, take up of visits, our take up of the two year old check, immunisation take up and good levels of development. So with Family Hubs providing a good model for integrated service delivery, we really knew that there was more that we could do in the early years space. Um, we, uh, we embraced an opportunity a couple of years ago to work with the Early Intervention Foundation uh, through their Early Years Transformation Academy, which allowed us to work with a number of other local authorities and to look at what was working um, through the sort of evidence base. And um, we started, to, we, we, we got together uh, senior leaders from midwifery, health visiting, primary health, public health, uh, voluntary sector, uh, as well as the local authority. And uh, we saw input from, I think we got input from about 400 parents and more than 50 practitioners across the local area. And really interesting is parents were talking to us about the same duplication and gaps in the system that practitioners were raising. And actually parents were as keen as us to see a better use of the resources that we do have. So as we mapped out who does what um, and uh, uh, who, who was doing what across the different disciplines, uh, GPs, midwifery, health visitors, children's centres, nursery workers, there were obvious opportunities to deliver differently, really building on that idea of shared service delivery, integrated service delivery and shared accountability. And we know that with shortages in some professional groups, actually integrated service delivery makes more sense. Um, and I guess also um, the potential for digital solutions are now being increasingly tested, uh, approved and now desired by parents and practitioners. Uh, and you can see uh, some of the, the comments that we got from families and practitioners. I'd like to meet other parents and families. There are gaps in contact with health professionals and they left me feeling isolated. Uh, I'd like access to health advice in an environment where my children can play. I want a seamless service antenatally and postnatally. I'd like consistent advice and access uh, support from one place. So moving on to the next slide. Um, in, uh, in an early uh, model, we co-developed uh, an early health strategy. I think we called it From Surviving to Thriving. And it was based on this idea that each agency would pledge what their contribution to the local offer would be. Uh, following the work with the Early Intervention Foundation, um, that, as I said, involved the local authority, um, midwifery, community health, public health, primary health, housing, the voluntary sector, we co-designed a new child health offer that 
better joined up with best start and school readiness agendas. So what we did was we, uh, we have integrated our health visiting and early help uh, staff through a contract arrangement with the local health provider. We've co-located midwifery services in the family hubs. We're now offering uh, virtual antenatal and postnatal classes and groups. And uh, the, the <coughs> we, we, we're, um, we're also offering drop-in sessions where families have a range, uh, where, where families can access a whole range of support services. We've created uh, volunteer community maternity champions. Uh, we've created shared toolkits uh, for the practitioners so that they develop a, a shared language. And when they're talking to families about support offers, they're all saying the same things. Uh, what we've, through the integrated approach, we can identify additional needs or su specialist support needs at the earliest opportunity. And where we've really looked at uh, the universal and the targeted offer, we've moved resources from universal um, in order to be able to provide a, 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 a more robust target offer targeted offer that really affords a lead professional for all families on, on that program. And it offers the ability to think whole family. The flexibility to use digital uh, resources uh, to support information sharing and assessment also, I think, assists families in being equal partners in any support plan for them. Um, since the introduction of these initiatives, uh, we're seeing uh, we're seeing significant reach of the digital uh, antenatal and postnatal classes, uh, with each session now allowing a hundred families to join. Whereas pre-digital offer, when it was face to face, there were opportunities for only ten. Uh, Ninety-five percent of our children under four are now registered with family hubs, and during the pandemic, uh, we were in contact with all new mums. We sent out new birth packs and we, sure, we ensured that each of them, and I think this is really important, that each of them had a link worker. Now that might have been through their informal network or through the network of practitioners through our integrated model. Uh, we know that that support provided a lifeline for some women uh, who found the connection really helpful. And what it's meant is that now there's increased engagement with other support services, uh, which I think is really positive. Um, one of the things that parents were consistently highlighting was the importance of relationships. And I think that, that, that came out from Jess as well. Um, Relationships and uh, connections are, are, are really important to people. Now we can't always agree, uh, we can't always guarantee as professional services that there'll be one worker for one family all the time that they need support. But the brand of family hubs and a clearly articulated support offer with digital options does provide some continuity for families. Uh, we've rolled out Welcome, a uh, speech and language toolkit across all our early year settings and practitioners, which again offers real consistency in terms of messaging and the advice to parents. We've received lots and lots of positive parents, uh, positive feedback from parents uh, who have felt well supported from our integrated offer over the last two years. Um, and uh, we, we participated in the early years review that was completed by ISOS following the first lockdown uh, to consider, I think it was about considering how baby sighted we, are, we were um, during the first lockdown. Uh, and, and really interesting, we had great arrangements across frontline practitioners, uh, but it was a good reminder to ensure strong strategic relationships. We know that successful early help services do require continuous work across uh, uh, at all levels to ensure that we're sharing the same goals and that we have a shared understanding of how we're going to achieve them, including that sense that accountability for driving improved outcomes. Um, I think this is particularly important in early years 
where the policy drivers still aren't clear about whether it's health, social development, learning or care that's the main driver. Um, and now that we have the new health footprint across the ICS and ICPs, it becomes really important that we have that uh, join up at the strategic level. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, I don't think it's uh, surprising that, uh, uh, that, that, that there are a number of challenges uh, 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 and a number, of, a number of things we can use to um, facilitate overcoming those challenges. Place is always a challenge. Uh, what's the optimum size for local delivery? Uh, and how do we make that work for different communities? Um, I think commitment across senior leaders uh, is key in facilitating exactly what we mean by local and how then we drive that local offer. Um, local need and national priorities can be more or less challenging depending on the resources of a local area. Um, given the makeup of Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea, we've really started to consider local by ward um, and really paying attention to what the graduated offer looks like so that actually we are moving away from that notion of universal meaning for everyone because there are many parts of our community that actually aren't reliant on public services or want anything to do with public services. So how do we make sure we're targeting those families who do need the support that we've got available? Um, uh, maternity sits in a different part of the health system and the local authority has few levers to influence. Um, however, I do think that engaging, uh, engaging maternity, in fact, engaging all services in any re redesign early, um, I think uh, creates opportunities to really realize the art of the possible. Uh, IT is always challenging. Uh, in Westminster, we have an IT solution that allows uh, one family, one plan. Um, I think it's about uh, managing expectations so that actually we move forward incrementally, step by step, rather than thinking we're going to create something all singing and all dancing right at the start. Um, working across London is particularly challenging because often um, families might be accessing services in different boroughs and how we navigate that through information sharing arrangements uh, it, it can be quite challenging and just knowing who local leaders are in other areas can be really helpful um, in, uh, in, in managing those, uh, th those pathways. Um, our, uh, our early help strategy has a strong focus on early years and we recognize the critical foundations uh, that are laid during the first thousand and one days in terms of health developments uh, a, 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 and across the, the, the phases of childhood and into adulthood. Um, family hubs uh, have uh, our family hubs uh, that have estab been established through a multi agency steering group and then driven by that integrated leadership uh, have enabled us to join up our local offer in accordance with what families were telling us they want. Uh, and more of them are now getting involved, not only in shaping uh, what our service looks like, but also in uh, being part of service delivery. Um, really interesting, one of the uh, family hubs is led by uh, an exec head teacher who oversees a nursery school and a primary school. Uh, and during the pandemic, the family hub uh, was providing a food bank. Uh, and uh, the, the, the head teacher tells a story, he looked out the window one day as a lorry was pulling up with a truckload of food uh, donations. And just as he looked out, two lads jumped on the back of the lorry and started filling up their bags full of the food. And his instinct was to bang on the window and say, no, what are you doing? When all of a sudden he realised that that's, that's exactly what the lorry was for. It was delivering food for them. And so he found himself banging on the window and saying, please, lads, take what you need today and do come back tomorrow. There'll be more here then. Um, and, and, and I really think that's what fam what's 
that is the heart of family hubs it's about doing what's right for the community um our pathway across midwifery and health visiting uh means that parents can now actively participate in the healthy development of their child antenatally and postnatally they can connect with professionals and other parents through online platforms uh, and they can better resource themselves by accessing online uh, material and tools uh, that allow them to interact with practitioners in a different way, as I said before, as equal partners. Uh, we've designed a seamless service, uh, a seamless transfer now between midwifery and health visiting uh, using the online approach to get to know people. Uh, and we've developed more group-based support uh, on the back of what parents have said that they want. Uh, the 0 to 5 uh, checks are fully integrated with our community support offer, including nurseries and other early years settings. And by releasing a resource from the universal offer, it's allowed us to build a targeted support offer that now affords 21 face to face contacts from pregnancy to three years. Uh, and that's very much based on the evidence from MESH and of course from uh, FMP. Um, I think uh, it's a challenge to determine the right balance of safe universal support um, uh, against the need for quality targeted support. Um, we know that there's more that we need to do, particularly building our relationship with maternity services. I think we learned a lot from the last two years uh, in terms of providing support during the pandemic and which really allowed us to realize how to maximize practitioner time uh, and that level of informal support as well as the, uh, the online offer. Um, but we need to make sure that we use this learning now so that we do build back better. Uh, being an optimist, uh, I'm hoping that this is going to mean increased resources for early years. Um, I don't know if any of you read the recent publication about our schools uh, by Brickhouse and uh, Walters, where it was really good to see recognition of the vital part that the early years system plays uh, in children's journeys through schools. Uh, so I'll stop there um, and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you. Sarah, thank you very much. That was very comprehensive and some fascinating um, stats there. And congratulations on getting 90% of children under the age of four uh, registered with the family hubs, which is pretty impressive. Can I just ask a couple of quick questions before I, I, I come to, to, to Joe and, um, and Lindsay? You quite rightly pointed out the, the big um, uh, gap between uh, rich and poor in, in boroughs like KNC uh, in particular. We found, obviously, in the work that the Parent Infant Foundation has, has done, that obviously problems with attachment uh, are not limited to, the, to those from uh, more deprived backgrounds. You get many middle class parents, professionals who have some serious problems with their, uh, with their kids. And I wonder whether you, what your experiences are of dealing with people in KNC Westminster from less deprived backgrounds as, as well, how willing they are to come and look for your services, or whether you have to be more proactive because, you know, they need help and support uh, just as much as, uh, as others um, uh, do. And the second point was, you've spoken very much about families. How do we engage with fathers um, and, and how much are your services uh, aimed at uh, making sure that fathers are fully engaged in the the, the journey for, for newborns that uh, that their partners are going through as well? Great questions. Thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, yes, so um, it's really interesting working with uh, affluent families, and I guess um, very often their families with very high expectations, very articulate, very well resourced themselves and very clear about what they want. Um, and so um, our practitioners are all tra trained in uh, systemic, uh, systemic practice, so very much focused on the relationship uh, and a strength-based approach. 
Uh, very often, uh, affluent families will have the resources to resolve their own issues. It's about exploring with them how things have arisen that are creating the difficulties and then what the best solutions are for them and then what resources they've got in order to um, realise those solutions, which, which, which is often uh, a, a conversation rather than necessarily an intervention by us um, per se. Um, in terms of working with fathers... Can, we... can I just, before you go on to that, I mean, th there is a, 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 an issue about, it's not so much better off parents have got the resources to sort of seek out help in the, uh, uh, in, in the private sector, but many don't because they're partly in denial that they've actually got a problem. So if you've got some, you know, some hotshot people working in the city, lawyers, whatever, I've seen them within the PIF uh, services uh, who think they're great at being a hotshot lawyer. So therefore they must be great at being a hotshot parent as well. And then can't understand it, why they've got attachment dysfunction problems with a child, because actually they may be a great lawyer, but they've never really had to concentrate on being a great parent as, as well. So those people are really difficult to one track down and to say, look, I think you need some help here. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, what we find is very often, well, no, not very often, oh, we've had uh, uh, a number of examples where affluent families have been through a whole range of uh, professional support systems, private support systems, and haven't found the right solution and have found their way to us, uh, maybe through word of mouth with someone saying, actually, have you tried the local authority resource? It was very helpful for us. And as I say, through that systemic approach and the conversations that we're able to have, we have uh, been able to unlock different ways of doing things. Um, there's always going to be the issue of ego and whether people uh, want to accept that they need help, want to accept that they need to do things differently. Um, and I think that probably is more challenging for people who are very successful in other parts of their life, um, to, trying to make sense of why perhaps they're doing something really well over here, but not getting things right with their children. Really difficult to acknowledge uh, and, and admit and then seek help. We do know that they seek help privately. Uh, we've had many examples of where we've picked up the pieces where perhaps that hasn't worked out and they've been seeking something else. Um, I do think it comes back to um, the, 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 the relationships matter um, and trusted relationships are so important when we're thinking about working with families, whoever they are. And fathers, sorry, I interrupt you on that. Bit. That's all right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in relation to, uh, to 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 fathers, yes, more and more we're focusing uh, uh, our attention on what support we've got in place for fathers, uh, fathers groups. Uh, we have a, a whole, uh, uh, we, we have a voluntary agency, Boys to Men, uh, who are future men, sorry, uh, who are, are very much um, in, uh, uh, engaged at working with um, adolescent boys, absolutely supporting uh, young men who are fathers for the first time. Uh, and then we have a, a whole other range of um, support groups, uh, very much targeting uh, men. And really, uh, our, our practitioners, we, we did, we've done a lot of thought about how we engage fathers in the process of uh, talking about parenting and care and improving attachment and that whole idea of their contribution to a child's development. Great. So thank you very much. There, there's some interesting points in the chat, particularly about uh, dealing with uh, more affluent uh, parents. Uh, and Liz Curtis Jones has mentioned that Sarah mentioned a publication recognising the vital part earlier settings play in the child's journey. Can that link please be shared here? We'll we'll pick that up. Uh, Sally will pick that up, and we'll uh, we'll provide that link too. Um, Sarah, thank you very much. I'm going to go on now to to the Wirral, um, slightly less affluent than Kenton and Chelsea, perhaps in parts. Um, so Joe and Lindsay, Joe, are you going to kick off? I am. I'm just going to try and share my screen if that's okay. Can we see that okay? Can't see anything on the screen yet. Sally, do we need to do anything at your end? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, 
Joe, have you, you've gone to share screen and clicked on a presentation that you want to show us? Yes. It's showing as a square around it, so hoping that it should be coming up. Hmm, let me see if I can do anything. The technology was all going so well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, something, something's appearing. Something now. There we go. Great. There yeah. we go. Now you can say next slide, please. Okay. Over to you, Joe. <laughs> okay. That's great, Joe. Okay. So just to introduce myself, I'm Joe Simpson. I'm one of the early childhood locality managers on Wirral. Um, the children's centre I'm currently sat in is Seacom Children's Centre, and I think Lindsay's just going to introduce herself. Hi, uh, yeah, so my name is Lindsay Costello. I'm service lead for We're All Not to 19 Services, so the health visitors and school nurses. So just to bit, give a bit of context about Wirral, so like you said, Tim, quite different in terms of um, the makeup of our community. So we do have, in terms of under fives, you have 17,000 under fives, of which 7,000 are identified as potentially needing additional support. So here on the screen is just some graphics around the background of our children, um, including a couple of points. So we have a higher number of looked after children and our good levels of development are lower than our national average. It's quite a diverse population in terms of need on Wirral um, and I'll pass over to Lindsay. So on screen you can see our co-produced parenting journey. This offers a framework through the early years working together across all of our services and offering key points. Um, it is a visual that shows the, the key points of contact from the Healthy Child programme but is a seamless offer with community universal points and targeted contact, contacts when higher levels of need are identified. The health visiting model for the area is a place-based model with a universal offer and a safeguarding targeted offer. We believe the universal offer should be protected as best we can and fits well within the ethos of the 1001 days. Really interesting, the, the debate around the affluent and the universal and, and where we target support. So a really interesting conversation and some thoughts that I'll take away from the from Sarah's presentation. Um, effective early intervention is established through our midwifery links, through our partnership working with Joe's teams and, and, and our, my team's some co-location and um, early notifications for women and families who, who have that additional support need. Multi-agency training that we've had across the, the, the areas for following FMP evidence base and supporting trauma-informed and ACEs approach to the delivery of the parenting journey. So those opportunities for multi-agency training have been a real benefit to the work that was done around the parenting journey. In, in part of the COVID response, the collaboration across services demonstrated we are still here with centres remaining open and accessible and health visitors who were then required to support other areas within the system as part of the community services prioritisation document were supported to share work across teams and to ensure that contact was prioritised for families in the area. An example of this was the Welcome to the World resource pack that we had as a, um, a delivery to all new birth families, families with a new birth. And we had a, a direct response quote that I wanted to share because it quite, had a lot, quite a lot of impact for us when we were looking at preparing this. So I really don't know what would have happened if you didn't knock on my door that day. I feel like it was fate you have helped me and my family like you will never know. And I have more confidence now. And, and that didn't separate between kind of which service was that. It, it was just feedback from a family that felt supported at that time. So it really reminds us how powerful working together can be. As we move through the parenting journey to focus on two other key points, um, the nine to 12 month development review. For this, prior to COVID, we used opportunities in terms of, of co-location, increasing incidental access to knowledge around the offer the shared offer 
and in COVID we were able to use a pro forma and work together to ensure families were offered. This was a local quality plan that in recovery felt the community services prioritization prioritization documents set out very clear guidelines for what could be set down and what could be looked at in, in terms of partial delivery and I think what it hasn't offered is guidance to areas for the stepping up and, and, and what needs to happen for, for anyone that was missed in that time and I think local areas and leaders have had to, to plan those offers th themselves really without that so our two-year offer uses the ages and stages questionnaire, working with um, settings and within our early years to, to plan and develop a heat mapping exercise. So we're, we're looking at um, mapping the, the areas of, of need in terms of the planning the early years strategy, in terms of what provision needs to be in certain postcodes and certain areas, and ensuring that that right provision is there. So an example, which Joe will expand on a little bit later, is our speech and language communication pathway. Um, the access to two-year funding has an uptake of around 91%, which has been a success of this, really, in terms of this pathway. So thank you. I'll hand back over to Joe. I'm just going to go on to our 1001 days pathway. So last year, we all became a pilot programme for the 1001 days by the Health and Wellbeing Fund. This is led by um, one of our partner organisations, which is Koala Northwest, which is a community, a community charity. So there's ourselves in terms of the local authority, public health colleagues, midwifery, health visiting, and our community and voluntary sector, which all work to our 1001 days pathway. So this is really a more detailed um, part of our parenting journey from naught to two and breaks down exactly what groups and support is available for families every step of the way. So there's been some strategic groups set up in relation to this and also operational groups. So really being able to share universal support for families across all those organisations, which historically maybe hasn't happened. But I think it's definitely developed a more seamless transition for families in between services um, and then hopefully noticing less of the referring on to different organisations and it becoming a much more one system. I just wanted to mention as well, as part of um, trying to do things differently on Wirral, a couple of years ago, we opened a birth centre in one of our children's centres. And this was in response to the Better Birth paper, which was mentioned earlier on. Uh, I think it was Jess that mentioned this. So currently we are children's centres with the ambition to move to family hubs, but we really have a varied offer within our centres. So birth centres, we've had 55 babies born in the centre I'm based in here. We've also got food bank support, social supermarket, which has enabled parents to volunteer within the system and be able to go on and gain the confidence to get qualifications and, and gain employment. And we've also had our local library as well, just co-locate with us, which we're hoping will be a really good holistic approach for families to be able to access as we move forward to family hubs. And then we'll just move, move over to the what's on guide. So this is a, a guide that is shared on um, in, in paper form, in leaflets. It's up in the centres. It's shared on the virtual platforms so that families have access to know what is available and what those groups are, where they can access. So it's had a real success in terms of it being co-produced. So we have a, an advisory board where we have a multi-agency attendants and parent carer attendants and we're able to shape those services in terms of the feedback deliver our healthy child clinics uh, you know alongside groups and, and all of that what we um set out to do is within the the what's on through the covid pandemic we had to take a, a rapid innovative response as other areas did and, and switch to a virtual My Child Can um, sharing videos and, and resources and links to the Healthy Child Virtual Clinic as well. The collaboration and partnership that we were able to establish optimised any opportunities and minimised any risks at the time. 
the shared digital offer has had over 1 million impressions and 18,000 engagement um, recorded at a point in time. We balance some of the need for the awareness of um, digital poverty to deliver resource packs to families where we knew, you know, that was a challenge in terms of knowing whether people had access to social media, but we were able to pick up from contacts we'd had previously to be able to deliver those packs. The virtual offer then provided the continuation of the parenting journey that we spoke about before with the virtual healthy child clinic receiving really good feedback in terms of it wasn't something that we'd done before and unlike all areas we had to take that fast pace to to try different and used um accurate and then settled on attend anywhere as our virtual platform and we've had some really positive feedback and i think again when we look at families' needs, we had a, a feedback from a mum of twins who said, actually, I just wanted to speak to a professional. I didn't need to get them all ready, get them out, get the bus to the centre to have the conversation that I was able to have. So we are looking at maintaining some of that vi uh, virtual offer. I think um, the experiences that we've had over the last two years, combined with our knowledge from our partnership working prior to COVID, sets out kind of a number of topics that we have as our priority. So health inequalities, being aware that the, the impact of what we have just been through has um, shown us that our contacts now seem to have a higher level of complexity as we start to unpeel understanding and that a disproportionate um, effect across disadvantage has, has, has been recognised. With th some of that context being around um, financial housing, isolation so we're working hard to try and plan the priorities into our early years and early help strategies across the area. As Lindsay mentioned earlier um, we all last year developed an integrated speech and language pathway so this was co-produced with parents um, and partners and was a way of mapping out and designed, um, designing targeted assessments and programmes of support for families to support speech and language and where to go if you needed any additional support um, with your child's speech and language skills. Um, to the right, you can see this was based on a cohort of children. And I think it was mentioned, Sarah mentioned it earlier around welcome screenings. So this is from our first assessment of children to our last assessment of a cohort of children. And in between those two assessments, there will have been a programme of support for those children based on their needs, um, developing those skills for speech and language. So we're able to demonstrate here how effective the pathway is in using those assessments, effective interventions and, and what an impact they can have, as you can see with more children scoring green for their age appropriate level. And then this was just some of our feedback from parents. So we obviously capture feedback um, to support and develop our service, but also to build on the confidence of our parents that have been coming to different groups, as you can see, saying that they're talking a lot more with their children, that their child's making more noise um, and that they feel more confident in supporting their child's communication and language. So what's next steps for, for Wirral? Um, I think Lindsay's mentioned around continuing to recover from the pandemic um, and the increase in demand, I think that the last few years has brought. We'll be launching our early years strategy um, with colleagues in public health, our community and voluntary sector, um, and with our parents as well. And the ambition to become family hubs, I think across the next year are our priorities. And then just to continue to understand and respond to the health inequalities that we know we have in the area and to continue our work with the Liverpool City region um, around the, the work for the speech and language and on all of the areas that meet within the, the levelling up agenda. We have secured, um, you know, we felt quite an impact from the COVID and from the way we've had to, to make the changes and, and the impact for the area feels quite high. So we've developed some new roles. So we've got a, a speech and language role who is um, will be based in, in the health in the 0 to 19 team, but will work within the early years 
teams to support speech and language. And then we've got a separate early years role as well. Um, we've got some additional roles within the older range. So we've got an ADHD because we've found that we've had a huge increase in the um, send referrals over the, the last two years. And we're trying to understand that and map that at the moment in terms of what that means. Um, and then we've put um, other roles with, within the 0 to 19 team to work across. So they'll be really useful in terms of that understanding and what our next steps are. And then I think just stressing the importance and the impact that we can see from, from the joint working and establishing those principles for joint working. So more co-location, maintaining communication, ensuring coordination, joint, jointly understanding our risks and then planning and looking at things like the heat mapping of the ages and stages data to be able to guide us on those next steps, you know, the short term and, and long term. Thank you very much. Great. Joe, Lindsay, thank you very much for, for that. I mean, some fascinating things going on in, in the world and some uh, really interesting comments in the, uh, in the chat about picking up on some of, those, um, some of those ideas. I mean, I love baby babble and toddler bop and some of the stuff you've got in your program <laughs> there. Um, thank you for that. We haven't, you've, you've been so comprehensive. We haven't got any questions in the Q and A, so perhaps people will come back at the at the end when we've got the open um, session. So thank you very much for the uh, for the meantime. I'm going to go on to our final segment um, now, where we've got Alison Morton, who's the chief executive of the uh, Institute of Health Visiting, and followed by Professor Gabriella uh, Conti from uh, UCL. So Alison, can we start with you, please? Yes, hi. Thank, thank you so much, Tim. And it's lovely to be here. Can you see my slides? We can. Yep. Fabulous. Um, so as Tim said, my name's Alison Morton. I'm delighted to be here today representing the Institute of Health Visiting. I've been asked to talk about current challenges and opportunities for health visiting in England. So it really is the plus and the minus. I'm not going to dwell on the problems. Obviously, there are many, but there are also huge opportunities. Oh, that not working. Sorry, my slides. There we go. Sorry, <laughs> technical glitch there. Um, so we all agree that giving every child the best start in life is a really good idea. I've not met a single person who disagrees with that. And it's fantastic that right now at this moment in time, moment in history, you could say we have this opportunity to develop the Start for Life vision and also alongside that refresh the Healthy Child program. And it really gives us an opportunity, I love this picture in this slide, to take stock of where we are now, but also through the eyes of the child about where we want to be. What do our children want us to do with our services that we as adults have the privilege to build for them? Uh, and our view is that public health and the Healthy Child Programme needs to be seen as an investment and not a cost, because in fact, it is the smartest of all investments to give every child the best start in life. So where are we now? Well, even before the pandemic started, we had a problem in this country uh, with widening inequalities, with a massive burden of non-communicable diseases, which is coming like a train through a tunnel, which will hit this country and the economy in an enormous way into the future if we don't address it. We've got soaring costs of late intervention and a problem with invisible vulnerable children, 2.3 million vulnerable children in England, and a third of those are not known to services, so they're not getting the support that they need. And actually what COVID has done is it's made this an awful lot worse. So across all indicators, we've seen an increase uh, in problems and vulnerabilities affecting families. Uh, this is some data from our survey, but there's a whole raft of other studies that have come out from multiple sources. We know this is happening across the sector. The pandemic and its impact on babies, you could say, has barely begun. And at a time when we should have seen investment in our services to meet this increased level of need, like we have seen across the NHS with their recovery plans, actually what we've seen in health visiting is uh, soaring rates of uh, ratios of children per health visitor, missed uh, and incomplete health reviews and a postcode lottery of support. So where are we now? Um, well, these are the uh, process outcomes that we measure for health visiting. And what this slide shows, this is the latest data that was published just this month, as there's a huge variation between the lowest and the highest uh, performing local authorities in England. Uh, the data, um, this is masked in the national data set, but if you drill down to local authority level, this is what you'll see. 
Um, and the data also just worth flagging now includes mandated reviews. So these are assessments of babies, children, families, mothers and fathers um, done over the telephone using non-face-to-face -face methods, despite uh, these individuals not being seen. So they're process outcome measures, but what do they tell us about whether the Healthy Child Programme is actually working? Uh, did we find the vulnerable children and does the service have the capacity to meet the needs that it's finding? And actually with this data, there's absolutely no way of telling that. Uh, but what we do know uh, from other data sources, um, this is from parents, voices of parents, voices of health visitors, and also from published research, is that despite health visitors' best efforts, some parents are getting a really good service and others are getting virtually nothing. Uh, so we have a problem. I'm not going to dwell on this side because lovely Gabriella is going to talk to this in a minute. Uh, we have a problem, suffice to say. Uh, this is the uh, graph of help visiting numbers. They've hit an all-time low. Why does that matter? Because it translates directly into help visitors' time. So we've heard a lot about working with relationships, it, um, you know, drilling down, exploring need. You can't do that if you don't have time. And actually, if you cut help visitors, what you're doing is you're cutting face-to-face -face time with families to build those relationships. So that's the bad news. What about the opportunities? <laughs> so I wasn't just going to focus on, on the bad news. Uh, and the good news is the government has pledged to take this seriously. So they have uh, in the budget in the autumn made a pledge to the early years. So that's a great step in the right direction. £500 million overall, £300 million for Start for Life. Um, and then the idea of these family hubs. So this is an investment in premises and facilities. But what we do know is that their success will depend, like it did in Sure Start, on having the right workforce within them with capacity and capability to, to do the task in hand. Um, and what we also got through the spending review was this investment in these health visiting workforce pilots to develop a modern skilled workforce, making the most of the skill mix teams uh, under the supervision and leadership of a health visitor. So um, just four key principles. What do we need to build good services with that in mind? Four things I just want to uh, uh, highlight today. The first is proportionate universalism. So we've heard a lot about this already today. What does that mean in reality? Uh, well, the principle is set out on this slide and this slide shows the prevalence of childhood obesity against areas of deprivation. So what you'll see is that there's a highest prevalence in the areas of greatest deprivation, but the danger of only focusing on those areas is that all of the children living in these areas who also are affected, and this is for every single child indicator, not just obesity, you'll see exactly the same prevalence ratio. Uh, if we don't um, um, have services in those areas, then they miss out. So actually what we need is a universal service for all families with identification of specific needs as they arise and then additional provision to those families wherever they live. The second principle is we need to deliver the breadth of the Healthy Child Programme. This is important uh, in all areas. We can't just cherry pick the bits that we like. Um, health visiting is much more than five mandated contacts. And this slide shows just some of the work of health visitors, uh, their clinical role, uh, which straddles multiple government department priorities for physical health, for both adults and for children, mental health, social needs. It's not just about child development or the outcomes of the Start for Life um, vision. Uh, these are health uh, metrics we need to measure too. So just pulling out a few on that slide, um, things like genomics, there's a newborn genome screening program coming through. That has a role for health visitors. Screening, babies discharged from the neonatal unit, uh, women with postnatal physical problems after delivery, children with childhood illnesses. These are all health issues and support the reduction on the, uh, the pressure on the NHS with health visitors contributing to that. Thirdly, uh, we need to build our infrastructure with the key ingredients to deliver the outcomes that we want. Now, that sounds like total common sense, but we need to do this in the complex and messy real world with the families who mess up our statistics when we're doing research, the families that are hard to reach. Um, based on proportionate universalism, we know that um, all families will need a little bit of support. Some families will need hardly anything, and, and that's absolutely fine. But this is a period of dynamic change for families having a baby. So how you are in the antenatal period may be totally different to how you are in the postnatal period because unexpected things happen. Uh, so you might have a baby who's born preterm or sick or has a disability, 
uh, as a parent, you might uh, develop a perinatal mental health problem. I mean, nobody plans any of these things. So we need a system that's responsive uh, to change, to the, the changing needs of families over time. Uh, but also there will be families who have multiple complex and coexisting needs and often they don't even know where to start these families. They feel stigma and they feel shame, they struggle to reach out for help uh, and what they need is somebody with the skills to get alongside them, somebody with the time to build relationships which are key, it doesn't matter which research you look at, relationships are key to outcomes. Uh, we should not fragment uh, the support that we provide to these families facing the most challenging times. They need somebody to stand with them through that journey. Um, FMP, all the data for that shows this. Somebody who can work through the detail of their life with them and where they're getting a certain set of outcomes can help them to imagine a world where they might get a different set of outcomes and then to build their lives towards that with a plan. You're building on their strengths, nobody starts from zero, everybody has strength, and that takes skill. And this isn't filling in a tick box, uh, working with families. Uh, and then along the top, um, we need to uh, follow the whole of a continuum. We mustn't just focus on interventions, because actually uh, you can't do early intervention unless you find these families. So ideally, starting at the end on the left, uh, we need to prevent problems happening in the first place. Then we need to have structures in place to identify children with uh, clinical vulnerabilities, safeguarding vulnerabilities. And then the third line, um, uh, Chevron, is to engage families, to get them to engage into, in support. Uh, we've heard earlier how families don't often recognise they have a problem. Um, they're not queuing up saying I'm vulnerable and I'd really like to join a group. It takes somebody with skills to engage them. And finally, the pet parents who need the support the most are often the most likely to disengage the high rates of attrition. And we need uh, services that are there to uh, catch these families when they do disengage and, and to work through with them. Um, having um, disengagement should be expected. We should expect this. It shouldn't be a surprise. We should have services with practitioners with the skills to manage that. And finally, my last point is that the success of family hubs is dependent on the right workforce with the right skills, making the best use of skill mix, other agencies, voluntary sector, technology. We've heard from Lindsay um, about how technologies work so well, it has a, a huge place to pay, uh, but we need to do this safely. Um, and we need to work with families who come into the hub but also for reaching out to families who don't, uh, for the families who don't have the agency to, to reach out and ask for help. But in particular, uh, we need to keep babies and young children at the centre uh, when they are in distress because they can't reach out and ask for help. They are not seen by other agencies like school age children are, and they rely on others to reach out to them because otherwise they are invisible. So um, on my slide, I've got this uh, murmuration. So like the birds in a murmuration, where do you find the children within this massive population? Uh, the ones, how do you find the ones who need the most support? We have to go out and we have to look for them uh, because all children, uh, somebody in my team said, all children are universal until they're not. <laughs> just think about that for a while because they are um, so we need to think about this with a tiered approach on three levels a tiered approach to describing children and their needs in the population a tiered approach to describing our interventions and then a tiered approach to the skills and competencies um, of the workforce and there's some fabulous examples somebody's already mentioned the speech and language pathway which I was privileged to be part of writing at Public Health England it works on exactly the same model as this uh, Devon Health Visiting have been sharing with me their breastfeeding three-tier model, exactly the same principles. Uh, it can work really well in place and we need to do it for every clinical pathway. So my last slide is we really can do this. Uh, we really can give every child the best start in life. We have to keep believing this. No one left behind. Beautiful picture of star hops in there. Please don't forget babies like her. She needed us to reach out for her and so do others. And so at the IHV, we're calling for three things, workforce, sustainable funding, and to keep our eye on quality because it really matters. Thanks. Uh, back over to you, Tim. Alison, thank you very much. Gosh, you fitted an awful lot in there. <laughs> That's a lot to absorb. Great stuff. Um, Gabriella, can we go straight to you, please? Okay, I guess you can see my slides. Yep, that's fine. Yep. Okay, um, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here. So I'm going to pull up on Alison's talk. I think it fits perfectly well in talking about some challenges and opportunities, showing you quite a few numbers. Some of you might have already seen some of them before and come up with some, let's say, recommendations for family hubs. 
Uh, so this is pretty much the same figure that Alison showed, which showed first the increase and then the fall in uh, health visiting, working in the NHS numbers uh, fall since 2015. So there is nothing new here. What I've been doing for the last two or three years uh, uh, now has been to collect uh, data at local authority level from freedom of information requests, uh, primarily to understand how this relates to local level variation and what are the trends when we try to zoom in more um, than looking at this uh, nationwide picture. And first, I'm going to present some challenges related to the fact that there have been, as we know, barring cuts, but the cuts have been pretty much unequal across the various local authorities. So first of all, the numbers of uh, FTE staff in health visiting teams have been falling um, throughout. So what I'm showing here on the left is all data coming from FY request, and this is data on caseload holding staff, and this shows the average staff per local authority and presents the mean for each year for various type of staff, ranging from a total health visitor, green line, and then total clean mix staff, this orange line. So what this figure shows essentially that there has been a decline over time, pretty much across various uh, ranges of health visitors, various bands, and also skill mix staff. And if anything, there has been just a flattening uh, throughout the two pandemic years. Now, when we zoom in a little bit more locally, what we see? This is um, a picture that uh, I've already presented before. It's in a piece that I wrote at the beginning of the pandemic. And if we look at the cuts from 2016 and 19, and to say I have more data now, so this will be updated, we see that the cuts have been unequal across the various local authorities. And in very few instances, there have been also some increases. So first case of uh, unwarranted variation, if you like. So what's the consequence of that? Where unsurprisingly, kids are still there. So if you cut the stuff, you're going to increase the caseloads. So same FY data. In this case, we look at the total FT caseload holding staff, and we uh, use the number of children who are under health visiting teams provided to us by the local authorities. So we take the ratio of the two, and we have what we call the caseload. So number of children per FT caseload holding staff. And this figure shows, so this uh, green line is the median, these are the top and bottom quarters of the distribution, and this year I reported the mean and the standard deviation. So what you see is that no matter how you look at it, the general pattern is that the mean has been increasing over time, but also there has been more variation. And this become even more evident if we look at, again, variation across the local authorities of England. And to step aside from whatever was caused by the COVID, here I'm plotting numbers as of 1st February 2020, so just before the pandemic. What we see is that across various local authorities, there are some very good performing ones where the caseloads are lower than 250 kids for caseload holding staff to others where the caseloads are really high. And some of these are around London. So again, there is this unwarranted variation. Then what happens with the COVID where well, there was another lottery. We all know that there was the redeployment, especially at the beginning in the first wave where we didn't, weren't quite sure how to deal with the, the virus and many staff who were redeployed to COVID wards or to the front line. So what happened with the redeployment? So here I'm plotting figures for redeployment, really uh, the peak uh, of the first wave up to 1st September 2020, since the beginning of the pandemic. And we see again that there was variation in redeployment. Some local authorities were able to retain all their workforce, but others, uh, have faced uh, huge changes uh, with uh, a lot of staff, even more than 50% redeployed, with consequences that you can imagine with the mothers as small children being unable to have this much needed support uh, at much needed time. Now, the better news is that when we look, so in particular here, I'm plotting the data up to 31st of March 2021. We are currently receiving and elaborating the latest data. 
is that following you know all the uh, the news which emerged about redeployment in the first wave and the issuing the guidance about stopping redeployment, the picture is much better. In uh, the remaining of the pandemic, 31st March 2021, where redeployment is really much reduced as compared. So there was something good going on. So I have to say, I'm not going to show a lot about this, but during the pandemic, especially between the first and the second years, there were some positive changes in uh, quite a few local authorities. Then the other um, feature, which I could challenge, but in fact, as I'm going to argue later, it's a potential opportunity, is that there is a lot of variation in team composition. So we probably all know that health visiting teams are made not only of health visitors, but also case um, skill mix stuff. And the proportion of health visitor and caseload holding skill mix staff also varies at the local authority level. So again, this was already visible before the start of the pandemic. So if we look at these maps, the darker means that there is a greater proportion of health TV, uh, FT health visitors, a percent of FT staff. And this is true both in the overall England and in London, but when we look at what's been happening throughout the pandemic, then what we see is that in many instances there has been a shift towards more skill mix staff holding caseloads as compared to health visitors. And this has been happening pretty much throughout. So there have been already changes in uh, skill composition towards a greater skill mix, which is in line uh, with the, the uh, Start for Life plan. And I think this, this could be an important opportunity. So unsurprisingly, if all this has been happening, again, kids are still there. This variation in health world, the public health workforce is going to lead to variation in service delivery. And so following up on some data that Alison has shown, here I'm plotting some data analysis from the service delivery metrics, where I look essentially at the minimum, maximum, and the mean in the proportion of visits carried out on time, and this is for the new birth visits. And this was at the time in 2021, where in species serious concerns about newborns missing health checks. But the pictures look very similar if we look at the six week, if we look at the 12 month, the mean is even lower, and if we look at two years. So as Allison said, that there is a lot of variation between better performing and worse performing LAs. Now, what is the what can we learn from this in ongoing work that I'm doing with support of many funders? Uh, what I find is that uh, if we if I join this data on the service delivery metrics with the data from Freedom of Information request I have collected, well, unsurprisingly, you find a positive correlation between the FD staffing health visiting teams and the proportion of visits delivered on time and a negative correlation between caseload and proportion of visits delivered on time. So to put it simply, if there is no workforce, you're not gonna carry out your visits. Uh, these are correlation, I can tell you, preliminary analysis uh, from causal impacts of cuts on service delivery visits uh, point to the same direction. You need to put the workforce in place to have the visits delivered. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is this ongoing work, which hopefully will come out later in the spring, where I'm also looking at the economic evaluation. So where these cuts, uh, pure savings, or actually are going to lead to higher costs down the road in terms of worse outcomes for mothers and children that we can cost. So stay tuned for more later in the year. So after all these challenges, well, I did mention some opportunities in terms of skill mix, but what else can we learn and can we use in this new uh, family hubs deployment? So first thing, if we look around at our neighbors, well, it looks like Scott and Wales aren't doing that badly. So this is, again, freedom of information request from Scotland and Wales. And essentially what you see that they are very similar in, term, in, in uh, terms of proportion of health visitors in health visiting teams and caseloads. Scotland in particular, we probably know, has a huge proportion of band seven health visitors as a consequence of the recent reform. And both Scotland and Wales have a max of 250 kids per health visiting staff as caseload, as you see in this picture. So what are they doing differently? How do they manage to reach this? There will be, you know, maybe there's something can be learned from them. 
Then another thing that I have heard, there are already many of aspects that I'm going to discuss here being implemented in the presentations that I have heard so far. So there has been something good done in the past, and you know, so that's not uh, there anymore. We shouldn't discard it totally. And some of you might have anticipated that I'm referring to Sure Start. So in collaboration with my colleagues at the Institute of Fiscal Studies, where I'm a research fellow, we have been working for a few years now on the, the economic evaluation of Sure Start, starting from the first rollout of the program up to the peak in 2010. And in the first uh, uh, brief that we have uh, published, we have found that Sure Start actually improved child health and reduced hospitalizations. Here in particular, I'm plotting the reduction in hospitalization for external causes, so things like injuries and poisoning of children, big numbers, 10%, so more than 20% reduction throughout the life of the child. And we've also noticed that when we split by disadvantage, well, we found that these effects, if you look at the green line, this is for overall hospitalization, these impacts are all coming from disadvantaged neighborhoods. There was no impact detectable on more advantaged neighborhood. When we quantified this, what well, we can say is your start at its peak prevented 13,000 hospitalization per year in 11, 15 year olds. And we did a very simple cost-benefit analysis taking into account long-term savings. And we found that only in terms of hospitalizations, this offset around the third of the cost of the program. So it doesn't seem bad. Now we're looking at other outcomes as well. So what can we learn from this? Well, we don't know exactly how these hospitalizations were reduced, but all our analysis and ongoing work points to the fact that Sure Start was a one-stop shop. There were multiple services co-located and integrated, including health visitors, and there were some posting. So parents could go there and they knew they would have help. It was most importantly, I think, a physical place. So parents would congregate, build social capital, build a relationship, and there is also qualitative evidence on that. So one lesson that I think we've learned from our Sure Start work is that the model combining universal services with an area-based focus on disadvantaged neighborhoods in the spirit of proportioned universalism can be a successful approach for family hubs. I think this was it's an answer to a question that was done before. So I have some further recommendations and then I'm gonna conclude this, I would call it more personal wishes. Anyway, so first of all, I think it's really important that we have a cultural evaluation. This not only means uh, implement evidence-based approaches, and we can all discuss what this means per se, but it's particularly important that when you start doing something, you embed robust economic evaluation since the upset, that you track your cost and you try to compute your benefits or the, rate, the return to investment, because you're gonna need it anyway for a business case or to bring this forward and you'll need for the next spending review. Workforce is really important. I think we have understood that. And uh, from other survey work that I've been doing, that the Institute of Health Visiting has done, we know that, that there were a lot of reduction in morale in many, in particular, health visitors leaving the workforce. So we do need the proper plan. In the past, I've done some costing for various plans with, I would say, incentives for retention and for career progression. I mean, these people are very valuable. We should show them this. Um, one thing that I've become particularly interested in, and we've seen many applications during the pandemic, is the use of tech. And personally, I'm a supporter of using it to complement, if you like, humans, not to substitute them. And we don't know yet, but it's an important question. What's the optimal, more cost-effective skill mix and for whom? Well, how can we target it, different people with different mixes, and could it also be useful to maximize reach? And last but not least, all my experiences taught me that data is really important and there is probably more data available there than what's currently made available to researchers, but also in general to track pattern and to show the sort of figures that I've shown you. There are some local approaches, very promising, like Bradford is doing some amazing work, but this could be an opportunity to do it at scale. So yeah, summing up, there have been quite a few challenges along the way, and we're trying to understand what are the consequences, but we also have a great opportunity in front of us, so we should definitely take it and grab it. Yeah, thank you very much. Gabriella, thank you. You can draw breath now. Again, that was a very <laughs> packed full of information, some really interesting and helpful empirical 
uh, data there from your studies so far. I mean, just one observation I've got, and just looking at my own part of the uh, of, of the world. So I'm, I have a constituency in uh, West Sussex where you didn't have complete uh, complete data because not all the authorities had uh, responded. But next door we have East Sussex. Uh, and East Sussex contains some areas of deprivation. Sally Ann Hart, who's on uh, on the call, represents Hastings, which have uh, certainly got some big areas of, uh, of deprivation. And East Sussex financially has not been in a very good shape, and they've got problems with their with their finances. And yet, um, East Sussex is one of the highest rated children's services departments in the country. And on your stats, came out scored very highly in terms of health visitor numbers and uh, caseloads and things like that. I mean, it's just an interesting comment that even when you've got financial pressures, and we know how many, so many local authorities are under financial pressures, prioritizing those things produces the right results and socially produces great results, but financially saves an awful lot of cost and, uh, and angst later on as, uh, as, as well. So it's just interesting to see the correlation between outcomes and the finances of those local authority areas as uh, as well. Yes, Tim, thank you very much. I think that's a very important observation. So I haven't shown the data on the local finances that are part of this ongoing evaluation that I was talking about. But one thing we have seen in particular in relation to redeployment during the pandemic, but also in relation to cuts, is that that's exactly how you say. I mean, on the basis of those two examples, there is less correlation between local deprivation and the say redeployment or deployment in particular was more much related to the type of provider and this tells me that it's not only about finances it's also about what at the local community level you feel you are your priorities and what you're willing to prioritize in a kind of long-term investment perspective so that's certainly a very important point thank you um right folks we've got uh, about quarter an hour for um questions do put your questions in the q a um please i've got one there already which i think is probably coming back to you gabriella to start with um what are the best ways for local areas to contact and work alongside academics to embed robust evaluation in new programs so have people come knocking yeah. at your door have you had to try and um yeah. burst down their doors to get the information that you need for your for your research yeah, so um, absolutely, I, I had, I would say so far, a, well, a couple, if not more, like local authorities emailing me. Uh, the usual question that I get asked is, how do, do, how do I do a cost benefit analysis? How, how do I build up a business case to the point? And now with some colleagues, I'm trying to write a, a paper how to do it just to give some core principles. But yeah, I mean, um, I can, I mean, everyone is really welcome to email me. I'm always very happy to help um, as much as I can. Um, so I, the, you, I think academics are usually very open because we do realize that, uh, you know, what we do, you know, it's just to support improving what happens in practice. And of course, the more we can help on the ground, making things happen, the, you know, it's very satisfactory for us. Uh, um, so everyone is very welcome to contact me in any way they feel it's going to be more useful for them. Thanks, Gabriella. We'll make sure your contact details are on the on the website, along with all the slides and everything as well. Can I perhaps just come back to, to Joe and, and Lindsay in terms of um, what health visitor uh, workforce challenges you're seeing locally and, and what you're able to do to overcome uh, of this or how much of a challenge it really is? Lindsay, you've unmuted first, so I'll go to you first. <laughs> oh, you can see that. <laughs> I was keen. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it was a challenge. I think, you know, it was a, we had just implemented a, a service redesign in March 2020. Um, and, and we'd launched at the start of March. And we know by the end of March, we were aligned to the community services prioritisation documents. We did need to reassign staff into the wider system. And, you know, the, those pressures have, have continued, really. I think the, the work that we've been able to do together has given us some reassurance around when I talked about like the nine to 12 months, we looked at plans to ensure that contacts, we looked at, at risk. So we put a, a three team model in. So we had a, a duty team, we upstaffed the duty team as that point of contact. We had a safeguarding team and we had a births team. And that was how we, we managed. But I, I think very much something that I, I commented on in the 
we as individual services put those plans together that there wasn't kind of guidance that followed the community services prioritization document that kind of told you how to manage what you couldn't do um in those times so we, we definitely relied on the partnerships and, and what we spoke about earlier in terms of those contacts our risk assessments were rag rating our caseloads so we, we we implemented a a red amber green approach to contacts that may be able to wait contacts that needed to remain immediate and we mirrored social care with that approach in terms of what needed to happen in the local area i, I think um we we definitely are are really only starting to to come away from that in terms of the planning and, and the recovery and and certainly only starting to unpeel the layers of, of what that has done um, in terms of the staff that are reporting their contacts now, that level of complexity within those contacts are much higher, which then is a challenge in itself without the data that, that we've just seen, because um, it gives you longer, th th there's a longer recovery period needed then, isn't there? So, understand and, and move forward so sure. definitely being a challenge but we've worked the best we can at the time and you know we're incredibly proud of our staff that that stayed you know and worked in those partnerships that I've talked about and then we're, we're also equally you know it was the right thing at the time it felt the right thing that they went and did what they did and they worked in care homes and ITU and were incredibly proud of those staff and, and looked yeah. to support their morale coming back so it has been tough. And, and we know from our own experiences, just relocating um, uh, health visitors away from face to face so that uh, only some of the most deprived and, um, uh, uh, and families in, in much need of, of support got those face to face visits. And for, for first time parents in particular, that was hard. And of course, many new new mums were unable to go to uh, antenatal, postnatal classes, sort of baby and toddler uh, groups, and the experiences of babies who didn't get to see other babies until they were four, five, six months uh, old and didn't know how to react with them, let alone the interaction between parents ab about advice as to, you know, how you deal with all those sorts of problems. It's been a huge, huge issue. Um, we really struggled. Sorry, what we've really struggled with, just to add, and I did mean to mention it in the main presentation, was. Um, it's it's what we've talked about today around the family hubs and the incidental um, kinds of conversations and the support that comes when people drop in. And what we've had is a um, we have we haven't had the ability in both early years and ourselves to do drop in clinics or drop in yeah. um, groups. So the impact from that is then that everything needs to be pre booked. So the mum or family that wake up that need the on the day advice and support can't drop in. We are looking, we've got a plan as part of the recovery to be able to do those from April again as a drop in, because the challenge we've now got is that we're fully booked on the pre-bookable, so we can't just switch the drop in back in. Um, but I think that does then have an impact when you haven't had that incidental contact it has an impact in thinking about the attendance for the mandated contacts and things because yeah. you haven't got those relationships in that same way. I mean, again, we offered the virtual what's on, we had the duty line and all of those resources that were the best that we could do at that time. Joe, did you want to come in? I think just to add to what Lindsay had said, I think what also supported that was that the centres remained open during COVID. So there was um, an element of if families couldn't access digital support, um, they were able to come and speak to one of us within the centres and us be able to support them. And I think going back to what Lindsay said around the partnership really enabled that to happen. And um, we were able to then speak to health visitors that were here um, or via the phone and be able to support those families as well. And there's an interesting comment in the chat from uh, Lydia about appreciating Gabriella flagging up the risk of services who are over reliant on digital communications with uh, with families. So face to face contact with maternity and H uh, health visitor professionals uh, are in, important to build up that trusted uh, relationship. So um, the things need to be complementary. Alison, do you want to make a point? And then can I come to you, Sarah, before I then go to Sarah Noldy's uh, office just for the Westminster experience? Alison, do you want to come in first? 
Yes, a really good uh, point about digital and virtual contacts. And I think of our view at the IHV is they're not good or bad. It's not binary. They have a, an enormous uh, contribution used in the right place at the right time for certain families and, and families have valued them. There's some good examples of people delivering breastfeeding support using video, uh, but actually they're used for mandated health assessments. Uh, there's no evidence of their safety or effectiveness. And going back to my point about we need to build infrastructures with the ingredients to get the outcome. So if at the mandated contact, you want to see the mother, the father, the partner, uh, the other parent and the baby. So there's uh, potentially three people you want to see. By definition, you're only going to be speaking to one of them. So you're relying on that person having the agency to advocate for the other two. And they may or may not be able to do that. And also for some clinical conditions, we've had cases cases of um, uh, children with deafness who haven't been recognized, children with cerebral palsy who haven't been diagnosed. You know, these are serious conditions that actually early intervention really makes a huge difference. So actually, we're, we're going to be storing up a huge cost later down the line if we don't get back. Yeah. So what we're asking at a bare minimum, mandated contact should be face to face um, for all the obvious reasons. You can't assess somebody you can't see. And Sarah, just in, in Westminster, you said, I think, in your presentation that you've been joining up maternity and health visiting uh, services. So um, but how much of that has been out of a, a position of, of, of weakness of, of, of numbers on either uh, side? Well, obviously, there's complementarities and there's joint, joint agency working is, uh, is beneficial. But is it also trying to fill some of the, the gaps because you've uh, under, understaffed as is the problem, particularly with health visitors in so much of the country? And you're on mute. The first time I've had to say that. There we go. <laughs> oh, someone had to do it. Someone had to do it. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there are there there, there is a, a, an issue with um, health visitors, uh, numbers of health visitors. Um, but I think actually where, where we started on this journey was the outcomes that we were seeing for children, particularly in the early years, and how we might reorganize our services to get better outcomes. You know, I, I, I think that, um, you, you know, uh, uh, Westminster and KNC are interesting authorities because of the makeups in terms of the very wealthy and then the, uh, the, 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 the families living in deprivation uh, and how we organise resources to make sure that everyone gets the best out of what we've got. Um, and I think, you know, what we've heard a lot of today is how that sense of a mixed workforce with a range of service options uh, and a range of resources that can pro be provided online or face to face is absolutely the way to go. And family hubs offer a model to, to do that. Um, I don't think it's about one thing replacing another. It's about how we knit them together to provide the, the, uh, uh, the, the best tapestry of services for our communities. And I think part of it is it's got to be designed with them because mm. ultimately, you know, they, they have the best understanding of what their needs are and how we they respond to them. Thanks, Sarah. Um, can I, Meg, can I come to you in Sarah Oni's uh, office, which are probably is going to be the last um, the last question. Over to you. Thanks, Tim, and thank you. I want it to be really, really interesting. And I do just want to pass on Sarah's apologies that she wasn't able to make it today. Um, what I was wondering, we've had some conversations previously about some of these children that have been missed over the last couple of years, who haven't been able to have face-to-face -face or their full five face-to-face -face mandated contacts with health visitors, and whether anyone's got any kind of plans with that cohort of children who are now possibly age two or between one and two and the kind of catch-up that they might need um, with any missed contact they've had with health services and any kind of targeted plans in place in any of the programs that are being discussed today to try and facilitate any of that. It, it is an interesting point isn't it because we're talking a lot about catch-up in for school aged children, um, which is not just about academic catch up, it's about all the sort of social interaction, mental health and everything uh, catch up. Uh, Linda's just said that, that all their, uh, their booked places are, are full for sort of new parents coming through. But then there's that, that ge ghost generation potentially from the last two years during the pandemic, as Meg said, are, are coming up to two in some, uh, uh, in some cases. How on earth are we going to one, assess the level of damage that has been done to them potentially because they haven't had those services, they haven't been able to, to spot some of the problems that they may have, let alone all the lack of interactions with other babies, other mums and 
and extended family members as as well when even grandparents were uh, were not really able to go and visit uh, uh, newborns how on earth are we going to assess what that problem is let alone um, do something to, to to make sure they haven't been left behind and, and and catch up how big of a problem is this actually going to turn out to be do we think Lindsay, you've got your mute off first. So again, I presume you want to come in. Yeah, so a couple of things that we've tried to do. I don't think it makes um, a full reassurance around any, any children that have, have not had that face-to-face -face contact. But for the nine to 12 months, um, any, any children that were missed, because what we were struggling with in the recovery was how do you look back and plan forward and be in the current as well? So that was where we looked for um, Joe's team to support with some of the nine to 12 using a proof former that we'd put together and they were able to highlight any risks back. So it was an at attempt to work together to resolve some of that. We've applied for some, there was COVID funding, recovery funding that we've applied for. So that was the two roles that I spoke about, particularly for the early years. So we've got an early years coordinator and we've got a speech and language coordinator with the task within the job description of um, looking back at some of those caseload lists, looking back at some of those waiting lists and seeing if from a, a review there's any need to, to make any contact. We can use social media to put out, you know, have you missed the review? Would you like to pick it up and put some additional sessions in the system once we've got those people in post? So that is something that we're trying to do. I think when we talk about unpeeling and, and fixing that recently I met with for the older part of our contract, we've got some subcontracts with Brooke and, and Bernardo's. And Brooke raised that the emotional maturity of the young people that they are speaking with for their, um, their learning around relationships, around sexual health, their emotional maturity is what they would have previous. So for the year 10, year 11 students, the questions that are being asked are the usual questions the year eight, year nines would ask. Yeah. And that kind of guides us for the real importance of what we've got to do with these young ones who we don't want to then layer later with with that emotional maturity delay as well so I think it is a long term when we look at things like that I think it really is a long term fix for this what we've been through but it was an interesting point around that really interesting observation there um folks we've run out of time um I think that's been a really really interesting session and an awful lot of of information of data of case studies uh, and contrast between various areas of the country and how um, some are coping better than uh, uh, than others. So can I, on behalf of uh, our audience, thank um, all our speakers today, to Jess, to Sarah, to Joe, Lindsay, Alison uh, and Gabriella. We'll put all the slides, contacts and um, some people are going to come up with some more information, Jess in particular, on the PIF um, uh, website. Um, you all know how to get hold of uh, Sally, who uh, acts as the secretariat for uh, the group at, uh, at PIF, if you want any further information. Um, but that's been really helpful. We'll be meeting again uh, in a couple of months' time. I think, Sally, we haven't quite got the date yet, have we? Um, but we'll distribute that as, uh, as usual. We usually don't have any problem getting people to turn up anyway, as this morning yeah. is demonstrated again. Sally, yeah? Uh, we do. I don't have the date to hand. We've got a date in April and one in June. So then yeah. we've got a joint meeting with the APPG for infant feeding in April and then one around mental health in June. But I will circulate the dates with the, with the recording and slides from today. So we planned out three three of these sessions up to the summer um, recess. So we're, we'll circulate the specific dates when we finalise those. So look, thank you very much, everybody. Very worthwhile session uh, and stay safe. <laughs>